So to understand the history of the lithium ion battery, we just need to talk about this one guy called Goodenough. John Goodenough, aged 97, he's still working in the field of batteries, incredibly smart. So he's almost like the Stan Lee of batteries, though he's older than Stan Lee, he still lives now. So 1912, uh, Lewis experimented with lithium as a battery material because of its high energy density. But uh, of course, it was Goodenough who kind of pioneered the approach of using lithium and manufacture all of these uh, different kinds of batteries. So the LCO stands for lithium cobalt oxide. It's a pretty good battery, but it was uh, overtaken by LMO. And then uh, LMO is lithium manganese oxide and then lithium ferrophosphate. Lithium ferro ferrophosphate has got the most applications right now in the market because it's a very, very stable battery. I will show you the comparison in the next couple of slides. By the way, 2017 was when he was 95. He still came out with uh, uh, some improvements on the existing lithium, entirely prototypical, but uh, there are some uh, good improvements that he suggested. So these are the different variations, variants on the lithium ion batteries. So all of these, the first five, so this is LCO, LMO, NMC, LFP and NCA. So this is what Tesla uses right now. So NCA has got clearly the highest energy density of all. LFP has got the highest applications of all. And uh, NMC has got the best um, usable capacity of all, right? You can actually fast charge it. You can put it through a variety of discomfort, so to speak, and it would still be quite functional. Right. Uh, LCO and LMO have uh, clearly lost traction because they've not gone through a lot of improvement. But overall, if you were to rate it, I find that uh, LFP just uh, rates 20 out of 30, I suppose. Yeah, it's the best battery as of now. And there are attempts being uh, made to find out what exactly it would be uh, performing like when it is nanostructured, for instance. So A123 systems have been experimenting with uh, nanostructured uh, lithium ion phosphate. And uh, those have been touted as very, very good batteries as well. So after understanding lithium ion batteries, one of the, the questions that we need to ask ourselves is, uh, do we have enough lithium in the world to warrant essentially replacing the, uh, the, the existing fleet of 1 billion cars? I'm just talking about cars now. I'm not including any other forms of vehicles, just consumer vehicles, right? Uh, so 1 billion cars, all of them need to be converted into electric. So infrastructure, that's a huge problem. But again, like, you know, what happens to batteries themselves? So there are so many different uh, metals being involved in the creation of batteries. So lithium, nickel, cobalt, iron, and what is manganese? Manganese, right? So lithium is actually pretty good in the uh, order of things. Cobalt, not so much. Nickel, we'd have to look for replacements. The reason all of these are being used is because iron is a good energy carrier. Manganese is also a good energy carrier, but it, it, it has got a very good stability for different voltages. So that's why it's being used. Cobalt is actually added to battery just to improve stability. And nickel is the best energy carrier of all. So this is why we use all of these elements. But you can clearly see that lithium stands above nickel and cobalt. So before we run out of uh, lithium, we would probably run out of nickel and cobalt, right? And so I've just taken time to make a little calculation here. Uh, so there are, there are two places where lithium is involved. So the cathode and the electrolyte. So by just math, so this is just the ratio of molecular weights, right? So LCO is uh, what I've done. And uh, by from the math, you can see it's, it, it occupies about 7% of the cathode, but the cathode itself is only 30% of the cell. So it brings it to about 2.2% of the cell, which is not much really. And uh, next we talk about the electrolyte, which is uh, lithium hexafluorophosphate. And the same math applies. And uh, this occupies about 4.57% of the electrolyte. But this itself is only 1.8% of the cell, which brings it to a very small fraction of the cell. Again, not too much. So overall, we can see that it occupies anywhere between 2.3 to 3% of the entire uh, battery cell, right? So this is just the battery cell that I'm talking about. So a complete battery pack, which consists of several hundreds of thousands of cells, is a combination of these. So the battery cells itself, so the structural members, because the cells don't have real structures on their own, and thermal management system, which is hugely important. The electrical circuitry, which is used for uh, external connections from and to the circuitry. The power electronic components, which is used for energy conversion, because you have uh, the DC-DC converter, the inverter, the, uh, uh, the switches, the relays, the sensors, all of them. And the accompanying electronics, which is essentially the BMS, the battery management system. Uh, the sensors, which is used for measuring voltage, temperature, current, all of those. And the safety circuitry, which is a mandate because lithium ion batteries are not specially safe. So just to give you an example, the Tesla Model S at 70 kilowatt hour, it weighs about 453 kilos. 
and uh, contains only 7.3 kilograms of lithium. So 1.611%. So what we saw was just in the cell, but when we add all of these together, it's only 1.611%. So, so when, when you do a comparison, so one kilowatt hour takes only 65 grams of lithium. So it's not actually much, right? And uh, right now, by recent estimates, we find that there's about 13.8 to 16 million tons. And uh, this is how the lithium consumption exists for lithium ion batteries. And you will find that this goes up, but uh, like judging by the amount of uh, lithium you require for a single uh, vehicle versus the amount that exists within the world, we can easily scale up productions to essentially satisfy all of the automotive companies which want to delve into lithium ion batteries. And I think it lasts for about 350 years, if I'm not wrong. That's the recent estimate. So the next question would be, uh, so the, the whole topic was battery management system. So till now we understood the system, but now we talk about why do we need to bat, uh, manage the batteries? So the overall objective is to optimize the life of the battery because it's hugely expensive and you don't want to keep investing in batteries every couple of years. Um, so for that, you need a five prong approach and this is not all of it, but I've exhausted only the basic uh, functionalities. There are some auxiliary functionalities as well. I'll talk about that as well. So optimal charging and discharging, as I said, your lithium ion battery is extremely sensitive to overcharging and over discharging. So you need to make sure that you cut it off at particular voltages, charging or discharging and then cell balancing. So all of your battery cells are like, uh, the soldiers from the North Korean army, they want to be them in sync all the time so that they can all provide like equal amounts of uh, energy, which means like voltage and current. And they, since they are all in parallel, most of them at least, like, you know, if you count a module, there'll be a certain amount of series cells and certain amount of par parallel cells, cells in parallel, especially, they all like to be at the same voltage, which means that they're going to be like, you know, doing some talking between each other. Uh, so that's a complicated circuitry by itself. Uh, and then there's a battery pack safety, which I'll come to at the end of the process. Uh, so like any other electrochemical thermodynamic system, this system is not 100% efficient, which means that you are going to be dissipating a lot of uh, heat from the battery cells. And that heat needs to be taken away so that uh, it doesn't cause heating up of the cells. And then there's this, this main thing where you sense everything and monitor and control uh, everything. So your, uh, your parameters would include uh, your voltage, your current, your temperature, your state of charge, your state of health, uh, so that you can actually cater, you customize your... Um, battery management system for a specific kind of battery and then battery pack safety, which we'll talk about. It's actually fun to just show you rather than uh, tell you. So as I said, these are the voltage limits that your battery loves to be at. And uh, this is what the battery management system does. So there are some electrical prote electronic protections uh, on each side so that if it goes even slightly outside the operating zone, it can kind of curb it and bring it back to limits. And uh, so the red, of course, is the failure zone. You never want to see the battery in that zone. And typical limits exist for uh, the current as well. And there's current protection devices, which we'll uh, talk about in the safety circuitry. Uh, and there's a specific method of charging all lithium ion cells. It doesn't matter what kind of electrochemistry, the numbers may change, but the overall process remains the same. So you need to adopt a constant current, constant voltage uh, methodology. So till a particular time, you would apply a constant current, make sure that the voltage is above uh, 3.7, 3.8, and you increase it along with time. And then once you get to the constant voltage time, um, you would you would actually keep it at about 4.2 and uh, you're golden. This is pretty much the way to, char to charge the battery. So monitoring and control, that's very important. As I said, like your lithium ion battery is like a spoiled child and uh, it needs constant monitoring and control all the time. Otherwise, if it goes out of bound, there would be some detrimental effects and uh, severe devastation, let's say. Uh, so these are the parameters that need to be monitored, the voltage, current, temperature, state of charge, and state of health, all of which we, would, we had discussed before. And uh, your cell balancing, as I said, all of the cells in parallel like to be at the same temperature. It doesn't matter whether it's series or parallel. It's, it all likes to be at the same temperature, same voltage. So when I say voltage, it means like, you know, plus or minus 10 microvolts or 10 millivolts away from each other uh, so that they can all produce the optimum current required for your application. Uh, so there are two types of balancing. So one is the active balancing. The second is the passive balancing. So your passive balancing is the simplest of all balancing circuitry. It just has some bleeding circuitry. There, there are monitors on each of these cells, right? Once a particular cell has been identified as the weak cell, all other cells make sure that they dissipate energy to reach the same 
position like you know when when i say position it's the same state of charge and voltage as the weakest cell in the system so it's not the best but it works and uh, your active balancing circuitry is a mode of non dissipative cell balancing which means that there's not going to be any real bleeding or like you know the current bleeding but uh, it's going to utilize some complex circuitry where one cell can talk to the other cell or one cell can talk to bunches of other cells and uh, just dissipate energy into the into them so that every everybody is at the same position at all points of time right uh, so this would also be a good segue into uh, defining power and energy cells so not all cells are created the same uh, sometimes you do it uh, deliberately because you want more power out of the cell and sometimes it is just uh, quality issues right so the deliberate attempt to differentiate cells would be the power hybrid and the energy cells so your uh, energy cells are created to hold high energy which means the energy density of these cells is going to be really high uh, but the power output of these cells is going to be pretty low uh, the life is also going to be pretty high for an energy cell the power cell on the other hand it's being used in applications which require high power density for instance in your drilling applications or in your um, supercar uh, performance applications right and your hybrid cell is kind of uh, a trade off between the two the power and the energy cells it could be positioned anywhere between the power and the energy cell right so the reason i mentioned that is because each of these systems would require different kinds of monitoring and different kinds of balancing right to give you a simple example uh, a power cell having an energy density of 2 amp hours versus an energy cell having an energy density of about so energy capacity this should ideally say capacity not the density um so 3.5 amp hours could produce completely different peak currents at different points of time right so this is 20 amps for a 2 amp cell which is like 10c not continuous of course and this is 3.5 amps and it's it's operating at anywhere between 0.6 and 0.7c so as i described uh, electrochemical cells are not 100% efficient they are proper electrochemical thermodynamic systems which will not uh use all of the energy and convert that into work so there will be losses due to different elements and uh, these are the common uh, reasons why cells are not 100% efficient right but the first would be uh, the difference between the open circuit voltage and the working voltage because it is a physical system there are activation losses there are ohmic losses and there are uh, concentration losses because these require a uh, moving ions from one electrode to another so the open circuit voltage and the working voltage are never going to be the same right and there is ohmic losses of course the i squared r losses otherwise called joule heating losses right and uh, because th there are actual reactions involved in the process uh, there's going to be changes in reaction enthalpy there's going to be changes in uh, entropy because one side is just it wants to go one way but it doesn't want to go the other way so there's going to be changes in that and there's going to be enthalpy of mixing because there is uh, diffusion happening in both the electrodes and uh, the ions are essentially being dispersed into the solution and coming out from the other side so that and then phase change of materials this is not very common but it is present in some batteries when some gases are liberated um and then change in heat capacity which is again not a very pronounced effect right so this is bernardi equation which essentially highlights the major uh, contributors of the heat right so this is as i described the difference between the open circuit voltage and the working voltage and this would just be the change in reaction enthalpy or change in open circuit voltage with temperature and these two would be the i squared r losses in each of the electrodes right and uh, there have been several attempts to simplify this model and uh, get out the exact heat but uh, there are several elements of endothermicity and exothermicity of the reaction right so for instance when you charge the cell part of the reaction could be exothermic part of it could be en endothermic and that could change depending on the cell chemistry as well the last would be your battery safety uh, no offense to tesla but this has happened to a, a ton of tesla cars uh, the manufacturers typically specifies a three layer protection which is optimization of energy density versus safety so the moral i suppose would be greed is not good so don't pack more energy in the cell than you can actually dissipate and the second would be the safety devices within the cell there are a ton of safety devices which are present in the cell for instance the the cid would be the circuit interrupt device which essentially recognizes high voltage measures it and just breaks the circuitry and uh, there's a pdc fuse which is positive temperature coefficient it's a high current fuse and uh, your safety vent or rupture disc this is used in extremities so let's say a reaction goes bad on one of the electrodes and there are some gases being produced which would be hydrogen oxygen nitrogen 
uh, methane, ethane, ethylene, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, any of them, right? So all of these are likely to be produced at uh, all points of time in the circuit. And because you don't want the cell to uh, swell up, uh, one of your questions was answered, right? The, the cell also swells up because of uh, side reactions. There are a ton of them. And because uh, the pouch cell is essentially hermetically sealed, they have absolutely no place to go. So you need all of these uh, rupture disks or safety vents to just liberate the gases as and when they are created. Uh, but one can understand that once the gases are liberated, essentially the cell is bound for failure, right? It's, it's deemed to fail. And there's a separator meltdown. So the separator is actually a wonderful design. It's a piece of plastic, usually polyethylene, polypropylene, which has got like tiny holes in it. And all of these holes are just so that you can allow ions to flow through them. When a high temperature condition is reached, the separator being made of plastic would just have some plastic failure which is definitely not uh, redeemable. So once the separator melts down, that's pretty much it. So in that process, it will close down most of the ionic pores and uh, it will create essentially a barrier between the anode and the cathode, thus preventing the cell to be charged or discharged, which is not the intended function, but it does that anyway, right? So at a packed level, these are the things that are available. So HVIL is uh, high voltage interlock. This is just so that you can uh, touch the cell without uh, you suffering from high voltage uh, electrocution, right? So essentially this uh, closes down the entire circuitry uh, such that there's no current through the thing. The high voltage points can easily be meddled around with and nothing would happen to you, right? And uh, there is insulation. So in case of a thermal runaway, for instance, uh, insulation is very important just so that you can isolate the cell, uh, at least thermally, so that it doesn't propagate to the next cell. Right. There are so many other forms of uh, like, you know, failure of the battery. So cathode fouling or electrode fouling in general, delamination, your dendrite formation. So all of these are uh, disastrous to the battery, but not quite in the same way as thermal runaway. Right. And of course, you need a thermal management system, which is entirely flexible so that it can provide the amount of uh, coolant required to take away all the heat provided. Uh, or liberated during a thermal runaway incident. And FDSS just stands for fire detection and suppression system. It's not a mandate for uh, all battery packs, but having that is a good thing. And uh, next we just talk about batteries of the future. So this would probably answer some of your questions as to like what is being explored right now. So solid state lithium batteries, as I said, would be just like a, a step up from what we have right now. Graphene batteries being explored right now because graphene is just a very good energy carrier and it's got so many good properties that can be harnessed for batteries. And sodium ion batteries is just, imagine lithium ion batteries just replaced by sodium. Of course, the electrodes would be different, but the, the overall uh, interstitial or the intercalation phenomenon is the same. And there are some biological semiconductor batteries. There is another company called Store Dot, which is working on these. So these use uh, amino acids and peptide bonds to store energy. And uh, these are micro supercapacitors, which are made with high precision, yet their energy density is still going to be low, but they are good for small applications. Your metal air batteries are divided into multiple things. So pretty much all of the alkaline earth metals can be used in metal air batteries. Your redox flow batteries are huge stationary batteries, uh, which are uh, essentially used for stationary applications, like in conjunction with solar panels, for instance, right? And your triboelectric uh, nano generators called TENGs, they could be used uh, in wearables. And your foam batteries are another type of batteries which are entirely flexible. They have been attempted to use in uh, like foldable phones. Again, graphene supercapacitors will give supercapacitors a new look or a new property specification. And finally, this is, this is the best part of it. There have been attempts to do this as well, even though it's not very common, understandably.